Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. Worship that's happening a little differently as you will see us, your clergy leadership from our homes, giving you a glimpse into this Sunday's text and offering some songs and reflection. Thank you for bearing with, with us in this odd time to be the church. And I hope that you find this time meaningful as we are giving this a first run of what church can look like, uh, separated from each other, but still worshipful. So just a few words on what it might look like to worship at home. I hope that you would find a comfortable place, maybe like an old Luther Memorial pew that you might have in your house, or just anywhere that you can feel worshipful, that you won't be distracted, that you can really settle into God's word. Maybe it would be helpful to light a few candles and to just be in this moment with God. Maybe it would be helpful to have a cup of coffee and be in your bathrobe and just stay comfortable. I just invite you to find however this time can be meaningful and worshipful to you. So I offer this time for you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship this morning. reading from Genesis chapter 12. Yahweh said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and the home of your parents, and go to a place I will show you. I will make of you a great people. I will bless you and make your name so great that it will be used in blessings. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And all the people in the face of the earth will be blessed through you. Abram, who was 75 years old when he left Haran, began the journey as Yahweh had instructed, and his nephew Lot went with them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This Old Testament text for us this morning is Yahweh telling Abram to go, to go to this new place. 
And Abram is 75 years old. And God says, you need to go. Leave behind the land you've known. Leave behind the land of your parents. Leave behind your family and go. Get out of your comfort zone. And how terrifying that must have been for Abram to leave behind this place he's known. At his age of 75 years old. He's leaving for the sake of God's mission. When God calls, God calls, as I was reminded in my ordination sermon. And more often than not, when God calls, God's calling us out of our comfort zones. God's calling us to the places that are unknown to us. God's calling us to leave the places we've known for 75 years and maybe for longer as our parents have lived there and our grandparents have lived there. God tells Abram to go. To, to this place that is unknown, to the margins of the world. And maybe God's telling us the same. Maybe God's calling us to go, to leave the place that we've known for 75 years, to leave our comfort zone, to get out and go. And sometimes, maybe though, that doesn't require leaving. What if leaving our comfort zones means staying right where we are, being locked up at home, being told to stay where you are so that you do not spread a virus? What if that's leaving our comfort zone? Or staying home on Sunday morning when you are so ready to celebrate the Eucharist for the first time as the pastor of outreach and community. That is outside of my comfort zone. It is so uncomfortable to leave our comfort zones, right? We like to stay where it's known, where we know what to expect, where we've then for 75 years, we know how it all works. And yet God says, go. Get out of that known place. Go to these other places. And how scary that is. How terrifying. Especially if you've known that place for 75 years. There's deep history in that. And yet God is there too. In that fear, in that unknown when we are stretched beyond our comfort zones, God is there. God is there with us when we are fearful about a virus that is spreading across this world and we don't know how to stop it. God is with us when we are disappointed that worship is canceled, when we were so ready to be pastor of outreach and community for the first Sunday. And it gets me wondering... God doesn't just call people like Abram and you and I. God also calls whole institutions, churches, to go and get beyond our comfort zones. So where is God calling the church? Where is God calling the church to go to this new place and be stretched beyond our comfort zones? Maybe that looks like worshiping by video in your own home that is beyond some of our comfort zones. Maybe it looks like dreaming of new ways to be community, to be church, and to no longer follow the status quo of what it has always meant to be church. So I ask you, church, is it time to leave our comfort zone? Is it time to do something different? to leave the church we've known for 75 years or more, to leave the church of our parents, to leave the church of our grandparents, because God is calling us to go. Go to the margins. Go to those unknown places of being church, for there will be a blessing there, for you will meet people you have never known before. Outside of our comfort zones is where growth happens outside of our comfort zones, is where we grow and God's mission grows and God's church grows. So I just ask you to ponder, 
Where is the church being called to go? To leave behind centuries of this is how we've always done it? To get outside of our comfort zone and find new ways of being church? And maybe you're like Abram and you don't want to go it alone, so you bring along your nephew. Find a partner for this journey of figuring out where we are called next to go. We never, ever go it alone. For God is there with us. God was before us, and God is behind us. Thanks be to God, and let the church say, Amen. Julie here in our home, um, what Bruce and I call the Magic Farmhouse. It's good to be with you this morning. I want to begin um, with the gospel reading for today, the Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. A certain Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, came to Jesus at night. Rabbi, he said, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can perform the signs and wonders you do unless by the power of God. Jesus gave Nicodemus this answer. The truth of the matter is, unless one is born from above, one cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said, how can an adult be born a second time? I can't go back into my mother's womb to be born again. Jesus replied, the truth of the matter is, no one can enter God's kingdom without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you must be born from above. The wind blows where it will. You hear the sound it makes, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be possible? asked Nicodemus. Jesus replied, You're a teacher of Israel and you still don't understand these matters? The truth of the matter is, we're talking about what we know. We're testifying about what we've seen yet you don't accept our testimony. If you don't believe when I tell you about earthly things, how will you believe when I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the chosen one. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the chosen one must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. God sent the only begotten into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through the only begotten, the world might be saved. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we have this story of Nicodemus, which is a familiar story to all of us, and it's found in this passage from John's Gospel that includes maybe the most well-known Bible verse in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one, that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. And that verse gets taken out of the context of the story that it's in. And we can't really do that because the story is what gives it its particular meaning. Throughout this encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus over and over again says, the truth is, the truth of the matter is. In the King James Version, that would have been something like, Verily I say unto thee, and in the version that we're reading from this morning, from the inclusive translation, it is, the truth of the matter is. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of night so that he wouldn't be seen. He comes to him really carefully couching his words. He says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. But the text doesn't say that anybody is with him. So who is this we know that Nicodemus is talking about? Is he just hedging his bets so that if he's wrong, he's not wrong by himself? And then Jesus and Nicodemus have this whole conversation about what it means to be born again, born anew, born from above. This born-again language is not language that Lutherans usually use, but what it means is central to who we are because Jesus is talking about being born of the Spirit. We recognize that at baptism in particular, but we also recognize that every time we gather. It really feels strange to me to not be with you this morning the high point of my week is always when we gather. And so having to make these adjustments for the good of, of the whole, for um, the need for the most vulnerable among us to be safe, having to make these adjustments so that um, the arc of this illness is, is flattened out a little bit, feels odd and strange to me. It's not what I would choose. But 
coming to Jesus wasn't what Nicodemus would have chosen either. And Jesus calls him to something new. Jesus says, Nicodemus, unless you're born anew of water and the spirit, you'll never walk in this new life. And we don't really know so much how Nicodemus responded or what Nicodemus did after that, but we do have a couple of clues that Nicodemus was faithful and that he did stay and follow Jesus. These days feel really different, and if we can um, kind of reframe them into Jesus calling us to be community in a different way, I think that will be helpful to us. And so I hope that in these days you will reach out to one another and just check in. As I've said in some of my emails to you, you can expect to hear from Pastor Laura and I checking in on you, touching base and making sure our community is connected that way. The last thing I want to say about this text is that John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, isn't complete without John 3, 17, which says God sent the only begotten, God sent Jesus into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him, through Jesus, the world would be saved. John 3, 17 is really the good news. Thanks be to God and let the church say, Amen. And now we're going to do the prayers. And so um, I invite you to consider the response, receive our prayer. Gathered together as the people of God. We pray for the church, for the world, and all those in need, saying, receive our prayer. Holy and loving God, we pray for your church. In these days where it is scattered, remind us that our hearts are drawn together in the body of Christ and for the sake of the world. Be with the church wherever it is found. Make us faithful stewards of your word. God of mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for the world, for the places where creation groans, for the places torn by violence, and for the people who are dealing with so many crises in the world. Give wisdom to leaders of all nations. God of mercy, receive our prayer. We pray for those in need, for the lonely, for the grieving, for the unemployed, for those who suffer in any way. We name before you Brenda, Carol, Edie, Marlis, Mary, all those suffering from coronavirus, all those suffering from other sicknesses, and for all who care for the sick. And for those we name before you now. God of mercy, receive our prayer. We give you thanks for the blessings of this life. We give you thanks for the birthday of Nancy. God of mercy, receive our prayer. Gather us at the last, O God, with all your saints around the table where the feasting never ends and the rejoicing is eternal. God of mercy, receive our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we lay before your throne of grace, O oh God, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, and let the church say, Amen.
announcements for today. Basic announcement is we don't know what's going to happen going forward. Right now, all meetings and other Luther Memorial events are paused and postponed. Um, we are uncertain about Pastor Laura's installation and we'll make a decision about that tomorrow kind of based on what the um, best information is we have in the morning. Beyond that though, um, other events for this week are canceled. So um, if you were planning to be here for a meeting or an event, just know that that will not take place. Um, that includes our midweek soup suppers and hold an evening prayer. I hope that you will do all of the things that we're being told to do to stay safe. Wash your hands, sneeze into your elbow, um, don't gather in large groups, stay as, um, as safe as you can. Even if you're in a low risk group, um, do that for the sake of those who are the most vulnerable among us. That was always Jesus' um, concern, was for the most vulnerable among us. And so I invite you, wherever you are, to receive this blessing. Beloved community, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.